Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. For any common technical issues, please refer to the help widget located at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. Questions will be answered immediately following the presentation. Any resources and links provided from today's presentation can be found in the resource list. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ganesh Anantanarainan. I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, over my career, I worked on a broad set of areas in systems and networking, ranging from mobile computing to big data systems to wide area networking and off-late video analytics, which is the focus of this webinar. So today, I'm going to talk to you about our video analytics platform that we call Rocket. That's a pluggable, extensible platform that runs across the edge and the cloud. And why are we doing video analytics? Frankly, because there are cameras everywhere, all the way from government enterprises uh, being deployed for surveillance, for traffic optimizations, to private enterprises in private buildings, in retail stores, all over the place. A startling piece of statistic is that there is a camera deployed for every eight people in the US. That's the scale, that's the, the, the scale at which we're talking about here. And what do people do with these cameras today? A variety of applications are actually powered by these cameras. Uh, the first set of applications that, you know, some of it that we ourselves have worked on, one is on uh, deployed by restaurants where they want to be informed when a car is pulling in or when people are walking in so that they can either dispatch ushers or sort of like pre-make certain food items. Uh, retail stores are another class of applications, which is also where video, uh, video cameras play a big role. People want to know, uh, both from a historical perspective, what's like the heat map of people moving around so that they can help with product placements, uh, as well as sort of like real-time intervention when they see certain customers that need help or assistance. Uh, smart cities and urban mobility is another vertical. Uh, we've actually ourselves done a lot of work in smart cities and, and urban mobility where smart, uh, you know, video cameras are used for both traffic congestion as well as traffic safety. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, traffic video analytics, which as I said, has been a driving application uh, for our project on video analytics. We call the work uh, video analytics towards Vision Zero. And for those that are not familiar, Vision Zero is an initiative that started uh, a couple of decades back in Sweden with the objective to eliminate pedestrian and biker deaths uh, that occur due to traffic uh, fatalities. And during the time we were starting with the project, we reached out to the nearby city of Bellevue in Washington, where they had just signed on to the Vision Zero uh, objective as well. And, and they were interested in using their already widely deployed traffic cameras uh, for traffic safety and traffic efficiency. And in fact, a startling statistic that caught our eye was the fact that Traffic-related deaths are among the top 10 causes for deaths worldwide. And so we were, we went at it that, hey, if we can make a dent at this, if we can make a difference to this, that would be great. And, and so we did a bunch of work, uh, uh, you know, the, especially in terms of using the Rocket Video Analytics stack towards analyzing the Bellevue traffic cameras, where we get a bunch of things for traffic volumes, for traffic planning, and so forth. And let me show you a short video of the kind of stuff that that uh, uh, video analytics can power in the space of traffic video analytics. Microsoft Research is working on a multinational road traffic safety project called the Vision Zero Initiative. Started in Sweden in 1997, Vision Zero aims to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries on the road. Here we show how a Microsoft Edge computing device can save lives by analyzing a camera feed in real time. When a person in a wheelchair is detected on the crosswalk, the device resets the pedestrian lights timer, allowing the person in the wheelchair to safely cross the street. As part of this project, we partnered with many cities all across both America and Canada. And uh, this helped us understand both the real use cases that they had, as well as the challenges towards achieving this solution. Uh, we're quite glad about the fact that this project won uh, two major national awards towards the fact that it was uh, 
it, it, towards the fact that it was a visionary project uh, in showing what can be done in terms of traffic safety and traffic efficiency with video analytics. So to summarize, our goal is to democratize video analytics. And what that means is that we want to do video analytics that is on live video, so it functions in real time. It is low cost in that the cost of running it is not prohibitive, especially if you have to run it 24-7, while at the same time, uh, the outputs are still accurate. A bit of context on the fact that the real reason why we got interested with video analytics was the fact that there was so much excitement around what the vision community had achieved in terms of how accurate the results they could produce for object detection, object classification, and so forth. And, and we just wanted to bring that out to the general public. And, and, and at that point, we had seen that the cost of doing it was really high, and it was not something that was suited for running in real time. And so that, in, in a nutshell, is our objective towards democratizing video analytics. This is the Rocket Video Analytics stack. Uh, right on top, as you can see in orange, are the fact that uh, there are various application verticals, some of which, which I uh, just explained in the early part of the webinar, uh, ranging from smart uh, cities to connected restaurants, retails, and so forth. And, and, and the, the, the framework allows for expressing the needs of this application in a very generic fashion. So you can construct a bunch of modules put together as a pipeline that then gets passed down to a pipeline optimizer. The pipeline optimizer, that's his job of picking like the best choices and applications that is needed. This is akin to a query optimizer, if you would, in a database. That is then passed down the layers where resources are allocated to it. And then this pipeline is run both across the edge and the cloud. And finally, what we do is we take the outputs of these live video analytics and pipe them to a database so that if you want to do any kind of historical analysis later on, that is something that you can go and do without uh, spending too much time, and it can be interactive. The cool part is, is, uh, is that you know, while I would finish the first part of the webinar, the second part, we actually are open sourcing this code. And my colleague would be giving you a walkthrough of how to use the code and the various components in the Rocket Video Analytics stack. So, so to just give a larger perspective of what the Video Analytics stack exposes, you know, you do see the software stack right in the middle there. But then on top, we make it easy for you to have very common functionalities that all Video Analytics applications want, which is a way by which we can do easy filtering and getting all the moving objects in a frame. How do you decode all the frames in a video? How do you track the objects across the different frames? How do you plug in various DNN models uh, from your favorite uh, DNN execution framework like TensorFlow? And how do you put all of these together uh, so that you can construct your application needs? And of course, this is the basic building block. And the blocks that you see on green on top takes these outputs from these building blocks in the Rocket Video Analytics platform and then builds up higher level applications like counting traffic, directional counts across time. How do you assess near collisions that happen? How do you get vehicle speeds and so forth? So today's uh, webinar would cover two major parts uh, of the Rocket Video Analytics stack, and I'll do a deep dive of the technical components. Uh, the first thing is how do we use approximation as a key tool for us in being able to run scalable video analytics across the edge and the cloud. And the second part would be switching gears a little bit and talking about interactive querying on stored video feeds. So let's get to the first part here. As I explained earlier, the Rocket Video Analytics platform allows for users to, exp to express their uh, interests, their applications, as a series of pipelines put together. This is an example of a pipeline. Where, the, where there is a decode, where there's an incoming stream that's decoded, and then there is a set of frames that are available. These frames could get resized. You might want to do frame sampling and not process all of them. Then you want to do some kind of background subtraction so that it does motion detection for you to know if there are moving objects at all. It's a very effective way to filter out certain frames if two frames are, are, are repetitive and have the same content. And then you go ahead and pass it to various you know, DNN models like like YOLO and faster RCNN and so forth. 
And these configurations are pretty important, like the various choices that you make here. What's the resolution? What's the frame rate that you go to? What's the object detector model that you're going to use? They have a huge uh, implication in terms of, of, of the amount of resources that is consumed, what's the accuracy of the output as well. This is an example of what happens with, say, the frame rate. Uh, we see that with increase in, in the amount of frames that you don't process and sample out, uh, of course, the CPU cost reduces, but then at the same time, the quality also drops. And we see a similar trend for resolution as well. More the resolution that you process at, the better is your output, but at the same time, the costlier is your processing. Uh, this is an example of, say, two, you know, of one of the videos in, in the city of Bellevue, where we see what the output looks like for an object detector for two different versions of YOLO. Clearly, we see that Tiny YOLO, which is a much cheaper version of the original full-blown YOLO, does pretty well in this intersection, which is, which is fairly sparse, not very cluttered. However, in the same city, you go to another intersection, what we do see is that Tiny YOLO no longer looks very good. It misses a lot of objects, it finds objects that are on the sidewalks to be cars, and it's quite confused here, whereas a full-blown YOLO does much better. And so, Putting it all together, you know, these various knobs that we have, the various implementation choices and the DNNs that you have, how much do they make an impact? Let's look at this graph here. This graph shows on the x-axis the, the, the resource demand that you need for running these, these various pipelines. Note that this is a logarithmic scale graph. And of course, on the y-axis is the quality or the F1 scope. And what we see here is that, look at these two points almost the same quality of the output, but, but two orders of magnitude difference in the amount of resources that they need. And this general trend is true for a variety of applications, including a general object tracker, uh, a DNN classifier that you might want to use. And, and why this difference? It's just simply because it's, it's dependent a lot in terms of, of you know, the kind of camera that you have, the lighting conditions at that moment, the color of the objects. And unlike SQL queries, unlike database queries, there is no uh, analytical model that is available for us to construct these resource accuracy profiles. And not only do we have to get these resource ac uh, accuracy profiles, we also then have to execute these pipelines across this hierarchy of compute options that is available. There's computer available on the camera. Uh, there's computer available in edge clusters, which is deployed by these enterprises. Uh, and then, of course, there is the public cloud as well, and there is the network connectivity across them. In fact, I would encourage you to check out this, this fun article that we wrote a couple of years back, where we were predicting that uh, real-time video analytics is actually would be the killer app for edge computing. So to summarize the problem statement here, we want to pick the query plan to go with the database analogy that says what are the various knobs, choices that we have to make, what are the implementation choices, what are the DNNs that we use, and then place these different modules across the hierarchy of clusters. And we have to do them jointly. So this is the problem statement. More specifically, decide the query plan and placement. And what we want to do is when there are multiple such video pipelines that are running, we want to maximize the aggregate quality, say the average quality, for instance, and then run them across this hierarchical uh, setup. And of course, there are diverse quality requirements for these different applications. Uh, like for instance, the, the tolling application might not really have strict latency considerations, but would need very high uh, accuracy because it would not be acceptable if you get tolled inaccurately. Uh, traffic lights, for instance, is an example of something where you need moderate to high accuracy, but you do need to happen it within a second or two. Uh, Amber Alert could be an extreme example. It needs not only high accuracy, it also needs to be super real time. So the framework allows for setting the various requirements that these applications have. Provide an overview of our solution. What we do is that when a query or a pipeline comes in, what we do first is run it through a profiler. What the profiler gives you is this resource quality profile. Note that we've seen this resource quality profile gives us the opportunity 
to make very good choices in terms of how efficient we can be without dropping accuracy too much. And then, of course, as I said, different applications have different requirements for what the quality is that they want. So these queries, uh, you know, all, 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 are, are all passed to a scheduler. The scheduler, of course, is the brain that goes ahead and, and decides, which, uh, uh, decides which implementation choices to make for each pipeline and how to run them across the hierarchy of clusters. So this leaves us with two main challenges. The first one is how do you efficiently generate this resource quality profiling? Note that I had said, unlike SQL queries, we don't have analytical models that are available for, for video pipelines. The second is, how do you schedule uh, for, for, for aggregate values of quality and still do placement at the same time? So the first part is, of course, done offline. And the second part is the one that is done online on a continuous basis. So let's first move to the resource quality profiling. This is an offline operation where the objective is the following. For every uh, you know, query plan, so to speak, which is every combination of configurations that we have, you know, say for this specific resolution, this specific frame rate, this specific DNN choice, what's the resource consumption going to look like? What's the quality of the output? That's the profile that we need. That, that the 2D graph that I basically showed you. Uh, of course, a trick here is a, a key problem here is that the, the quality is something that you can measure only with a ground truth. And for a general query in the wild that just comes in, there are no hand labeled data sets available. So one thing that we do is we use data results from what we call a golden configuration. So this is like the most expensive configuration that you can choose. We use that as the gold standard and then measure the results of all the other configurations against this golden standard. So what we primarily do during the profiling process is to have a targeted search for the most promising of query plans. Where we don't, where we don't necessarily profile all the options on the entire video set that we have, but we try a small set. We try to see if these configurations are promising. If they aren't, we let it go. If they are promising, we try it on more videos to see how that goes. Uh, but the, but one, one challenge in this is this profiling is not something that you can just do upfront once and then you're done. What we really need is periodic profiling because the video content keeps changing. There are times, for instance, say in a traffic video where there are a lot of cars. There are other times when there are not that many cars. If you recall the very example that I gave earlier, when things are not very cluttered, something very lightweight works just fine. And we want to identify and exploit those opportunities. So this is an example of, say, what would happen due to the value of, say, periodic profiling. In this graph here on the y-axis is, is what is the resource consumption uh, that we need. And the x-axis is, is, is roughly the accuracy of the outputs that are produced. Clearly, we want it to be more in the bottom and more to the right. And, and the, the, the set of blue and the red dots clearly will show you that doing just a one-time profiling uh, ends up with worse options than doing something much more periodic. So that's great. This shows the value of periodic profiling. However, I do a little bit of a cheating there in that in this graph, I have actually not included the cost of profiling. When I do include that, look at what the results happen. We end up with much worse uh, uh, you know, values in the fact that the cost due to smarter choices is all wiped away for the fact that we've paid additional cost in doing these profiling to get these choices at all. So in a nutshell, now the key challenge in this is to reduce the profiling cost. Uh, I wouldn't go too much into detail, but we use three key techniques here. The first one is temporal correlation, where if a certain configuration is bad, then it continues to be bad for a long time. Likewise, if a configuration is good, it does stay good for a little bit. And so we don't have to keep profiling uh, them all the time. So this helps us exclude a vast number of configurations out of the picture. The second one is that organizations rarely deploy cameras standalone. They deploy a fleet of cameras, say in the city, in the building, in the store, and so forth. And there is a fair bit of spatial similarity in the profiles of these configurations. What we've seen is, is we can cluster these cameras and do the profiling for just one of the cameras and pass this profile to the other cameras and that holds just fine. 
this dramatically reduces the cost and the third is the independence of these configurations where we've seen empirically that these configurations tend to operate independently so we don't necessarily uh, have to do the combinatorial thing of profiling all the possible combinations of configurations but can do profile these configurations individually i encourage you to check out our uh, seccom 2018 paper for more details on this profile so essentially the profiling uh, goes ahead and as i said generates this 2d plot of the quality versus the resource demand you know, we're smart about the fact that the profiling has to, uh, uh, you know, not consume too much uh, resources. But then at the end of it, now we end up with this, with this 2D graph, which then has to be passed to the scheduler. And often there is a lot of options that are now available. So now what we do here is that to make the scheduler's job easy, what we do is, is select, you know, the Pareto boundary of these, these options. Like for instance, Take these two points, the green point and the red point. Note here that the red point is strictly better than the green point in both dimensions. There is no trade-off here. In both quality and resource demand, the red point is better than the green point. Which means that we don't have to consider the green point at all as long as we have the red point. This is a point that we call Pareto optimal. It's a concept from uh, economics. And if you generate a boundary of all these Pareto optimal points, you get the Pareto boundary. And so the non-Pareto plans are no longer required for us because as long as we have some point uh, on the Pareto boundary, we're good enough. So that's the thing that we then pass to the scheduler in the next stage. And this, note that this dramatically reduces the amount of options that the scheduler now has to deal with. So this brings us to the second part of the talk in terms of the scheduling itself. And, and note that this is a, a multi-resource scheduling problem. I've been sort of like presenting these graphs for, uh, for simplicity as just CPU resource or just a compute resource. Whereas, I, whereas this is a problem in a hierarchy of clusters that includes not just the compute, but also the networking connection between the cameras to the edge to the cloud. And so what we do is we use the, the idea of a dominant resource demand for each combination of configurations and placement. And this is a concept that actually was, uh, was, was roughly now uh, generated during the, the, the time when big data analytics was happening for multi-resource scheduling. And so, so what this allows is that, uh, uh, you know, the dominant resource demand, it avoids lopsided drain of any single resource at any location. So, so the dominant resource demand, uh, you know, makes sure that, that we are using all the resources at all these these various locations in an even-handed fashion. And so when we, once we get this, this dominant resources, then we essentially use a Pareto band that ensures that we don't have to go through this entire search space, but only have a small fraction of the search space. In terms of evaluation, we've evaluated our system with a workload that consists of traffic cameras and surveillance cameras. Uh, these original frame rates varied in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, how much high res they were, what the frame rate, etc. was. And we used a variety of queries, which we, we again, you know, we've seen were important for, for lots of video analytics applications. And just to summarize, what we see was that we can get considerably better accuracy than competing schemes. And despite the various approximations that we made to the scheduling heuristic, we're still pretty close to what an optimal would do. So this finishes the first part of the talk where I showed you, you know, video analytics can be done across the edge in the cloud and how approximation is a key tool that we can use. Now let's switch to, to using these, the fact that we can do efficient live video analytics to say how can this power interactive video analytics on stored videos, on historical videos after the fact. And why do we want to do it? Simply because video recordings are ubiquitous. It's done everywhere. And, you know, being done in terms of highway systems, at homes, even on our phones. And, and today, you know, it's, it's, it's great that we have these CNNs, these convolutional neural nets. They do enable accurate query. Uh, for instance, you know, traffic planners in the city of Bellevue might want to know, find all the trucks in the video yesterday, in the last week, because this helps them know how the streets are being used and so forth. And if you want to do it, it's great. You know, this is kind of what the outputs would look like. It gives you all the trucks. But 
you want to do this today, it is slow, it takes a lot of time and it is quite expensive. And sure, so why? So let's fix these two problems. You know, we don't want it to be slow because then it's no longer interactive and there is enough to show that interactivity is quite important and we don't want it to be costly either. So what can we do about this? Well, one way to make the queries fast and not, not them be slow is we can analyze all these videos at in just time. Just on the live videos, let's analyze them and plug them into a database. But this is a very expensive solution Partly because enough studies have shown that a lot of the videos never get queried. So this end up being a bunch of wasteful expenditure. Expenditure that's close to $400 a month per video stream. Of course, at the same time, you can address this problem by just doing nothing at ingest time. But analyze all the videos at query time. But this also takes a lot of time. For like a month long video, it can take many hours. And month long queries are quite common for planners. It can take many hours. And this is hardly interactive. So, so this is kind of what we want to provide, which is enable low latency querying, low cost querying, and at the same time, not lose the fact that we still need high accuracy results. And we want to lose our large historical video data sets. Graphically speaking, this is kind of what we want to look at. If you look at these two axes, the ingest cost and the query latency, what we want to be doing here is that, of course, we want to be doing better on both of it, which is closer to, 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 the, you know, to the left end and the bottom for both these dimensions. And if an ingest heavy scheme, where we do all the work at ingest time falls here, in which case it's a great you know, kind of query latency, and if a query heavy thing where we do all the work only at query time when the user asks for it falls here, we ideally want to be here. This is kind of where our goal is. And towards achieving this goal, there are three main objectives, which is let's provide a low cost indexing. Let's still make sure that we achieve high accuracy and low latency at query time. And finally, as you can guess, this is a system that, that needs us to make these hard choices, these trade-offs between ingest cost and query latency. So first, let's get to low cost indexing. Uh, of course, we all know that, you know, we, that DNN compression is a pretty big uh, 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 thing these days. We can take pretty complex DNNs and compress them to make sure that they provide sort of like roughly the same functionality, but they end up running far fewer layers and, and so forth. And, and this is considerably cheaper. So we can just go ahead and say that when these you know, frames come in and we get these objects, instead of running these expensive CNN at just time and plonking them into an index, let's just run these specialized compressed CNNs. This is considerably cheaper. However, these CNNs are cheap, cheap for a reason. They're cheap because they're also considerably less accurate than these expensive CNNs. Like take this example where we're running a classifier that says what kind of object is it. So what we see here is, you know, an expensive CNN will sort of like produce the outputs by ranking what it thinks the object is, you know, starting from most likely to least likely. Like for instance, it could take a certain image and say that, hey, I think it's a truck, then I think it's a moving van and so forth. This ordering is not going to be the same for the cheap CNN. Because the cheap CNN would think that, hey, it probably looks like a moving van to me. So the outputs may not really match if you want to look for the, the rank one in terms of what the output is. But if you do look at it, the best result from the expensive CNN, what we've seen empirically, is, is within the top K results of the cheaper CNN. And for a very small value of K. So this gives us a great uh, uh, you know, leverage in terms of how we can use these cheaper CNNs and fix the problem of accuracy. So instead of generating a simple index, let's generate a top K approximate index here. Where what we do at ingest time is we take these frames, we of course run these compressed CNNs, and then now go ahead and put everything that's in the top K into the index. And so now when we put everything in the top K into the index, when someone is querying, now, this is not just an index lookup as we were doing before, but now you'll have to get these outputs uh, from the top K index, 
Now we'll run it through this expensive CNN, but now that we're running it through a far lesser number of frames, the expensive CNN has to do far lesser work than before. And after that, we, we return those frames. And, and so this way we ensure that, you know, while there is, uh, uh, you know, while there is low cost indexing, we also, you know, we also produce highly accurate results because of the fact that we have expensive, the expensive CNN at query time. This, of course, leads us to the next question, which is, okay, it's great, but how do we achieve low latency? Because we've just added a bit of additional work at query time. Earlier, we just had to look up the index. Now we have to run it through this expensive CNN to get precision. So to, to address this non-trivial work that we have to do at query time, what we do is we use clustering based on the extracted features of these DNNs. Uh, you know, just a little bit of context, you know, before the fully connected layers in these convolutional networks, there is a feature vector that gets produced. And, and usually what we've seen is that uh, images that have the same feature vector are mostly visually similar as well. And this has been shown in multiple studies uh, uh, in terms of, you know, prior work. So essentially what we do here is we take these, these uh, you know, we take these, these feature vectors and we cluster them. And so, so what we do here is in this, in this flow that I had before, first we cluster the objects and then produce the top K results. And then only on the centroids of these clusters do we run these expensive CNNs. Note that the number of centroids are far lesser than what we had otherwise. So this is kind of how you know the the whole uh, the, the the workflow looks like in terms of both achieving cheap indexing, uh, highly accurate results, and yet not too much work at query time, hence giving us low latency. Uh, of course, there are also trade-offs that you can do between the ingest cost and query latency. Like for instance, what's the cheap CNN that you pick? Perhaps you can pick a slightly more beefier cheap CNN, and then that might give you a lower value of k which means you might end up doing less work at query time. So these are things that a system operator can set depending on the choices they make. So for our results, you know, we use the same videos as before, the traffic and the surveillance videos. And note that we strive for target recall uh, and precision values of 99%. And so this is kind of what the solution looks like. I mean, this is where our ingest heavy baseline is. And this is where our, uh, uh, you know, uh, a query heavy baseline, which is one of the recent work uh, from, from prior work that we have. And so we end up falling here, which is actually substantially cheaper than an ingest heavy baseline and much faster than a query heavy baseline. So with our design, you know, remember those price point before that we have of close to $400 a month per stream, we can actually get it down to single digits. And likewise, for a five-hour footage, we can do it in a handful of minutes to go through a five-hour footage. Let me show you a demo of the system in action right now. Okay, so here is the demo of focus. As we can see, we can select different kind of video that we want to query. Uh, in this prototype system and different class. So let's say uh, I want to query this stray video that we call SITARD and we want to query an object that's dog because as a city planner we may want to know how many dogs and what kind of dogs show up on the street. And we can see that this video uh, it has sometimes people going walking around and uh, bicycles and uh, different objects. Um, so if we don't have focus, we just have baseline, um, then we do query, we, we click run. Then the query will go on, um, and then we, as we can see that we need to check many frames, basically uh, around 10,000 frames before we can get the results, which is going to be very slow, as we can see. On the other hand, uh, if we have focus, uh, we can do the same query, but now we select that we use focus, uh, which generate pro approximate index, and so we can save a lot of query time 
So now if we click run, then we can see that uh, the query latency becomes very fast. It's only three seconds, and you only need to check uh, 100 frames, then we can return results. We can see that there are two segments, and in this segment we see dog, and the other one we also see dogs. It's pretty cool. And we can also do different kind of query. For example, if we are interested in uh, bicycles in a different video, then we can select this and we can again do this query. Again, because of the design of focus, we only need to check very few frames at query time. So we only take two seconds to return the results and we can see the bicycles moving around pretty accurate. And if we come back to the baseline, it's still running. It's going to take a much longer time. Uh, since we don't want to really wait, I actually run this query uh, before the, this recording. As we can see that at the, at, at the end of this query of baseline, we overall need to process more than 10,000 frames and the latency is more than four minutes. So compared to focus, there's only like three seconds. There is two orders of, of magnitude improvement. And we can see the re return results are exactly the same. So these two segments with dogs. So we can see that uh, why focus is a much better option than baseline. Uh, I also wanted to say that this is part of the code that we are releasing. So Yoncha would also be showing a demo of is indexing in action. Uh, of course, some of the techniques that I didn't talk about today, but we're actually quite excited about, is you know, as I said at some point, that uh, uh, you know, organizations organizations deploy a fleet of cameras together. How can we use them together for video analytics? Uh, privacy is a big uh, thing we are we are quite cognizant about. So how is it that we can do private video analytics both on the edge and on the cloud? And finally, this is not all just about video, you know, DNN inference, but we also, you know, have projects that go on to update these models on these edge devices continuously. So to conclude the first part of this talk, I had shown how approximation is a very handy tool for us to run video analytics across the edge in the cloud. Uh, I had shown how we can use this live video analytics as 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 to to pipeline well into interactive querying of stored video sets as well. So in the next part of the talk, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Yon Chao Shu, who would be explaining about the Rocket Video Analytics platform that we've open sourced. He'll show you how you can get set up with it, how you can play around with it, and, and how you can use it for your own applications. Thanks, Ganesh. Hi, everyone. My name is Yuan Chao, and I am a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. So I'm going to walk you through the code of Rocket and show you few configurations of the pipeline. So at this point, we have some good news to share with you. As Ganesh mentioned, Microsoft Rocket Video Analytic Platform has been released recently. And everyone can visit the URL below and clone the repository from GitHub. And the link also contains instructions on setting up the environment. This repo puts together a hybrid Edge Cloud Video Analytic Platform, which is built on C-sharp .NET Core, and the cool part is that it allows TensorFlow DNN model plugging and GPU and FPGA acceleration, as well as container doc Docker containerization and interactive querying for the after the fact analysis. So many of these components in this platform are key building blocks for video analytic applications, including traffic counting, near misses detection, vehicle speed estimation, crowd control, and so forth. So functions you may find useful in this code include a line-based alerting and a selective DNN cost for efficient GPU and FPGA usage. And it also features uh, edge and cloud partitioning in which you can run cascaded calls to call cloud DNNs, for example, the Microsoft Cognitive Services or Azure Machine Learning, or shifted to uh, edge-only mode if the network is not available. And also, we have an interactive after-the-fact after querying on stored videos. For example, you may want to find all the frames 
which contains the red cards from the previous week. So next, I will walk you through the project and introduce five pipelines suited for different real-world scenarios. So Microsoft Visual Studio is recommended IDE for Rocket. Once you install this Visual Studio, you can simply click VAP.SLN to launch the project. So in Visual Studio, on the right-hand side, you'll be able to see 14 in total projects under the solution VAP. And each of these projects roughly corresponds to a module in the Rocket platform. So for example, there is a project called Decoder, and in this decoder.cs, you will find a function called getNextFrame, which returns the next frame of either live video streams or a pre-stored video file. And similarly, in the project darknet detector, you will find a frame dnyolo.cs where there is a function called detect, which use darknet YOLO object detection model to generate a list of YOLO tracking items provided an image or a frame from the video. And the main program.cs file is sit, sits inside this video pipeline core project. So in line 143, you will be able to see a big while loop in which each frame of the video is going through different modules. Which module this frame is going through is configured in a file called app.config. So in this file, we have pre-compiled six different configurations. For example, if we set the value of the pipeline config to one, it means every single frame of this video will be analyzed by the darknet YOLO v3 model. To execute this code, there are basically two options. You can either do it in Visual Studio in the debug mode or run it, run it in a command line tool like Windows PowerShell. Before running that in Visual Studio, you need to pass several application arguments. Those arguments are defined at the very beginning of the program.cs file. As you can see here, there are in total five arguments you need to pass into the application. The first one is a video URL. So the Rocket Pipeline accepts both local video files like an MP4 AVI file or a live video stream like an RTSP stream. And the second argument is a line configuration file. So in, in Rocket Project, we use line to define an area of interest where you care about this object. And the following two factors are sampling factors and resolution factors, respectively. So the sampling factor determines how many frames you want to run on this video. For example, if we set the sampling factor to two, it means we will drop half of the video frames in the file. And the resolution factor decided how we're going to downscale this video to speed up the processing. And of course, you need to specify what are the categories you are interested to be detected in Rocket. So here, we have a sample video put into this repository, which is named sample.mp4. And there is also a sample line configuration file corresponding with it. And here we set this down sampling rate to two, which means we drop half of the frame and we don't change the downscaling factor, which is set to one by default. And we care about all sorts of vehicles, including cars, minibus, minivans, and trucks. So the first pipeline that we are going to show is a configuration that generates alerts on objects in the area of interest. As I mentioned before in Rocket, we use a line to define the area of interest. So this sample video we included in this repository is from a traffic camera. In a total of five minutes video, there are four cars 
and one bicycle is moving down the road. In this scenario, we draw a line near the top right corner of the scene to detect all objects moving downwards. This snapshot of this video shows where the line is in this sample line configuration file. So in this file, each line corresponds to a line you draw on the scene, starting with the name of the line, the ID of the line, and four values defining the coordinates of, the, of this line. And the last parameter is an overlapping threshold. So now let's go back to Visual Studio and set this pipeline value to 1 and run this pipeline and see how it goes. After loading YOLO models, Rocket starts processing the video by running DNN inference on every other frame. As you can see, even if we set down the sampling factor to 2, the average processing speed is at around 20 FPS, which is insufficient for real-time video analytics. If you go back to File Explorer, you will find an output folder named Output All, in which you will find all the detection results from this DNN model. As you can see, at around frame ID 1300, the first white car shows up, which triggered this line and captured by this darknet YOLO model. And 22 alert was generated. Switching back to this folder, you will find all the alerts caused by different, generated on different frames. Since running the DNN on the entire 5 minute video takes a long time, I'm just going to show you the pre-generated result of running YOLO on this video. As you can see, all four cars are successfully detected, although it may take tens of minutes. So to speed up this detection, Rocket Platform also features a background subtraction-based detection module that can be used as an early filter. Compared with DNN inference, background subtraction is much cheaper and can be running on, G on CPU at a fairly high FPS. So now let's switch back to Visual Studio and see how the FPS goes when we adding this background subtraction-based detection. As you can see, the average FPS goes as high as 90 FPS because at this moment, there's no object, so no DNN is caught, and it's purely running background subtraction on CPU. At the time when a car shows up, the background subtraction triggers the DNN, and the DNN finds a car and sends the result to a cloud database. So even considering the latency of sending the data to a cloud database, the average FPS remains at 60, which is double the speed than real time.
As the application runs, I'm, going to, I'm also going to show you how to run a DB query to get the detection result from the cloud. So for example, this is a simple GUI to send this query to the cloud database. We have already set up a cloud database as well as a Azure Blob storage to store all the detection images. So if you run a query to find all cars being detected during this time period, you will get the result in half seconds with a total count of 21. So all the images as well as, with, as well as the metadata of the detection will be fetched immediately without processing tens of hours long of the video. Similarly, all the detections can be found in this output folder, output all. And the third pipeline we are going to introduce is detection object with cascaded DNS. So on top of pipeline two, we are going to add another DNN before calling this heavy DNN full fledged YOLO. So in many cases, we can run a cheaper DNN, which could already give you a sufficient high confidence. So in that case, only if the confidence is not high enough, we will not proceed to call this heavy DNN. So let's set this pipeline value to three, which corresponds to this cascaded DNN. Here, two models are loaded, which are the tiny YOLO v3 and the full-fledged YOLO v3. Background subtraction-based detection keeps running on every other frame at roughly 100 FPS. If it finds some movement on the foreground, it will firstly call the tiny YOLO model. As long as the cheap model has a sufficient high detection confidence, the heavy model will not be triggered. So here in this output folder, the output LTDNN contains all the detection results from this tiny YOLO model. Here you can see it detects the first white cars and the second black cars. While the app is still running, the third car and the fourth car will also be detected at a later point. So the third car comes and some new, up, some new detection results are generated. And if you switch to this output cascaded DNN folder, you will see the results of heavy YOLO object detection model, which as you can see are more precise and the confidence score is much higher. So in pipeline three, we have three modules sitting on the edge. However, this may not be feasible, especially when the heavy model becomes bigger and the number of video streams increases. So here in pipeline four, we move the heavy DN detector to the cloud, making it a shared service to multiple edge analytic pipelines. So in our Azure cloud, we have created an Azure machine learning service and deployed a Docker image with TensorFlow ResNet model. So Azure machine, Learn Azure machine learning service can take advantage of cloud FPGA accelerators and provide gRPC and TensorFlow serving predict APIs. Of course, you can always deploy a cloud model using a customer Docker-based image. 
So many of you have already been using Docker and containers. So for those of you who are new to Docker, let me say a few words about the extremely popular technology. So in short, containers allow developers to package up an application with all of the parts it needs, such as libraries and other dependencies, and ship it all out as one package. By doing so, developer can rest assured that the application will run on any OS, both Linux and Windows, regardless of customized settings that machines might have that could differ from the machine used for writing and testing the application. So for example, you don't need to worry about if .NET Core runtime is installed on the host of OS. Another difference in Pipeline 4 is we switch the local light DNN detector from a YOLO V3 model to a TensorFlow model. The rocket is designed to be compatible with different pre-trained TensorFlow model. Here, as you can see in the Visual Studio, we use a FARSAR CNN model based on ResNet, but you can freely change it to another model from the TensorFlow model zoo. Now let's set the app config value to five to run this pipeline for. As you can see at the beginning, the TensorFlow model is pre-downloaded to the local device, and then the GPU is initialized. So you can see when a car shows up, Rocket continues to call the TensorFlow model. And once the TensorFlow model detects there is a car without sufficient confidence, it will proceed to send a remote call to the Azure Machine Learning Service to verify whether it is a vehicle of interest. So in the output folder, you can see the result from the Cloud Azure Machine Learning Service, which successfully detects all this object as a kind of vehicle. So the last pipeline that we are going to introduce today is the container plus edge and cloud split. So different from pipeline four, here we also containerize the local pipeline of running background subtraction detector and light DNN detector. In this way, this pipeline can be transplanted to a different hosting OS, for example, Linux machine and being executed there. So here I'm going to show you a remote session of running this pipeline on a Linux machine sitting in Azure. So I'm not going to show you how to build this Docker image because it may take tens of minutes. Instead, we have already pre-built this image and put it down to this Linux machine. So this is the Docker image that we are going to run on run the Docker, run the Rocket pipeline. To run this pipeline, 
we simply mount this disk and also similarly to run that in Visual Studio we supply the videos the line config file and downsampling, downsampling factor and down resolution factor So after downloading and extracting the TensorFlow model, the app is running on the Linux machine. Because it's a cloud device, so the CPU is much more powerful than the laptop we are demonstrating here. So as you can see, as a result, the average FPS goes as high as 90 FPS. So you can configure the pipeline to send this result to a cloud database, as well as uh, some local storage service. And here, I'm going to log into this SCP into this device and see the outputs in the file system. So here, as you can see, there are also tens of detection results generated in this output R folder. So this concludes the webinar. These are just uh, five sample pipelines of the Rocket platform. So you can configure and put together your own pipelines and also reuse the output of the existing pipelines for further analysis of the video content. So we hope you get a sense of how, in general, the techniques look. So more materials and updates can be found at the Rocket project website. We look forward to your thoughts, questions, and bug reports. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. This is uh, Ganesh from Microsoft, and uh, we'll be switching over to the, the Q&A part of the, the webinar. Uh, so let me start with uh, you know some of the specific questions uh, that were asked about the the first part of the the techniques that were presented. One was uh, the ability of the profiler or the system to to cope with you know real time video streams, and what is the latency for processing uh, each of the video frames. So so you know upfront I would want to state that yeah the main you know, part of the video analytics platform is to be able to process live video streams, uh, which means that if it is a 30 frames per second video stream, the budget that we have to process each video frame is about 33 milliseconds. So, so that is something the framework automatically takes care of. Uh, you know, even when we're doing the profiling to find the configurations, uh, we only keep configurations uh, at which we can, you know, sort of like go at the, the required frame rate, and there would not be any buffering of the frames as such. So for instance, if we do have a heavy configuration, then we would appropriately make sure that the frame sampling is chosen so that uh, you know, there is no buffering of the frames and we keep up with the live frame rate. Um, and then there was another question on the second part of the talk around video indexing and video querying as to, uh, you know, how do we actually store the, 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 the outputs of the CNNs uh, that we do during ingest? And how do we do the clustering? So just to add to the content in the webinar, uh, we would like to say that you know, all the frames that are chosen for ingesting, we run it through the cheap CNN. 
uh, you know, of course, there is an optional aspect where we might, the ingest itself could have a frame sampler in it, but uh, all the frames that are chosen for ingest is run through uh, a cheap CNN. And uh, once the outputs of the cheap CNN is available, as we saw in the webinar as well, there is uh, there is both two kinds of outputs. One is the actual, you know, classification itself, and then there is the uh, then there is the, the the feature set that is provided. So we put both of them in a database, and along with the frame ID as well. And and so later on, when a query is asked, then we extract it based on these indexes. Uh, you know, there is a, a resource list that we have and a, where there is a project web page. And so we had a technical paper on this, uh, you know, late last year. Uh, this was at OSDI 2018, where the name of the work was Focus. So, so I encourage you all to check uh, the resource list and the, the paper for details exactly on uh, what's the schema used in this database and how uh, they are extracted. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, one of the questions asks, uh, how does Rocket, you know, sort of like compare with, with frameworks that are out there and being used for training DNNs, you know, like CNTK, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, and others? So we would like to state that with Rocket, our main focus and our main goal was on, uh, was on the inference. So we wanted to take live video streams and run, as we saw, a, a pipeline, which was a cascade of DNNs and uh, non-DNN modules on each frame. So from that point of view, uh, Rocket is quite complementary to many of the training frameworks that are out there. And uh, so as, as we demonstrated with pluggability of TensorFlow models uh, into Rocket that is available today, uh, anybody can use, you know, any of these uh, these frameworks, TensorFlow and so forth, to build new models, train new models, specialize them to their content and so forth, and then they should be able to plug that in uh, into Rocket. Uh, more specifically, in a nutshell, if 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 your model is already compatible with with TensorFlow execution today, you should be able to use that. Uh, inside of Rocket uh, straight away. So, so you know, while right now Rocket is not exactly focusing on the training part of it, uh, we hope that we, you know, models that are trained today in things like TensorFlow can automatically be plugged in. And, uh, you know, going forward, something that we do have in our uh, pipeline is, is to think of extending this compatibility beyond just TensorFlow to other frameworks like PyTorch as well, and broadly be able to have integration with uh, Onyx models. For those that are not familiar, Onyx is a is a general uh, uh, you know way by which you can represent models, and uh, you know many major frameworks and organizations already support ingesting and running Onyx models. So our hope is that with that it would be even more uh, uh, you know of a general story where. Anybody can build their models, convert it to Onyx, and then they should be able to run it inside Rocket. So that is something we do have in our plans. Uh, and more broadly with training, uh, there is work that we're doing right now where, you know, while there is one-time training that does happen, uh, what we are trying to do is, is sort of like have this continuous model where, you know, we all know that a one-time trained model is, isn't always good enough because there is... There is change in the scenes uh, as such. You know, for video streams, we can see that over time, there is change in the the video data as well. So there are new there's new classes, there are new objects. So so we need to adapt our model continuously. So something that we are also working on is uh, is a continuous uh, adaptation of these models over time. Uh, you know, incremental learning or continuous training of these models. So, so this is something uh, we should hopefully have more to report on uh, in the next few months. Uh, moving on, there was another question on uh, on how much effort does it take to sort of like extend Rocket uh, to verticals beyond smart cities and urban mobility, which which was sort of like used as uh, as uh, example use cases in the presentation. Uh, this is a great question. 
and uh, you know while we used smart cities and and urban mobility as a as a as a motivating framework and a driving sort of like application for for our work on video analytics the framework as such is uh, is in no way tied to any specific uh, use case or vertical. Uh, you know, Rocket is a framework that is designed to be broadly applicable to all kinds of uh, application verticals, including connected cars, you know, connected restaurants, and and uh, you know, internal uh, you know enterprise buildings and so forth. And we ourselves have done uh, many pilots and engagements. That, that go beyond just uh, smart cities and urban mobility, and uh, so so our hope is that you know the you know the the second part of the webinar where we presented the ability to put together multiple pipelines, you know construct these pipelines by putting together both uh, you know CPU based OpenCV modules and you know the cascade of many DNN models. Our hope is that is something that uh, you know people would both uh, use. And you know, check out from the GitHub use and be and apply it to many sort of like you know application scenarios, uh, you know, as we discussed. Hi, uh, this is Yuan Chao. I also got a bunch of uh, questions that I can answer. So the first one is uh, in early parts of the presentation, um, someone asked if Rocket is compatible to run on both Linux and Windows. And I hope uh, the uh, code walks through in later part of the webinar give you uh, give everybody a sense of how to set up uh, Rocket on both Linux and Windows. So the short answer is yes. And uh, if you visit the GitHub web page, the README file should also provide step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how you can uh, set up Rocket on both uh, environments. And also, uh, another question is, um, someone asked about uh, the benchmark results of Rocket, uh, because the, the first half of the talk talks about this uh, um, video analytics uh, efficiency and scalability. So um, roughly speaking, it's based on how you construct the pipeline. So for example, uh, the pipeline runs more efficiently if it has uh, cascaded models and early filtering for moving objects. Just to put things into perspective, so for example, on uh, NVIDIA 1080 GPU, we can support 10 streams at 10 FPS for uh, scenarios like car counting. And of course, the, accur the accuracy is largely dependent on the video content and in most scenarios that we worked on, 10 FPS is sufficient for uh, getting a reasonable accuracy. And if you dial down the FPS numbers to, say, uh, 1 FPS, and the number of concurrent streams uh, could go up to uh, as high as 100. Hey, folks, this is Ganesh again. Uh Moving to my, uh, you know, favorite question that that I get every time uh, this work is presented, is uh, what is the impact of uh, democratizing video analytics on privacy as such? You know, clearly cameras being everywhere has a cost in terms of of uh, you know us being monitored all the time and so forth. And and this is a, this is a great question. This is a, you know sort of like a tricky question and importantly a question that we pay a lot of serious attention to. Um, you know, something that we didn't get to cover today in the work, but, you know, we did make a brief mention of it, is that we take the privacy seriously both uh, while video analytics happens in the cloud as well as uh, it happening in the edge. So in the cloud, uh, we have solutions that we are working on that make sure that, you know, these video analytics modules run securely inside enclaves so that both the cloud provider and other co-tenants do not see what is running as well as what is the video content. So, so we, this ensures that the video content is only something that is visible to the person running the analytics. And uh, on the edge side, we, we are actively working on solutions where that allow for some kind of access control, where it allows for users to both whitelist or blacklist 
uh, you know, things or object categories that they would like even being shipped out of the edge. As we know, as part of, as you saw in the webinar, edge is a big part of to our story on video analytics. So we want to ensure that anything uh, that is that is getting out of the edge after the analytics is only run, is, is only something that the users have authorized to be shipped out of the edge. So, so of course, privacy is a, is an evolving story, and we and and but but this is something we take very seriously, and we already have many solutions in place uh, to ensure that you know private content does not get out of the edge. Neither, neither is it leaked to other co-tenants uh, in the cloud. Okay, so I guess this uh, wraps up the the webinar uh, uh, as such. Uh, you know. We strongly encourage you to check out the resource links that are there with the webinar, the project webpage. Uh, please go to the GitHub uh, link. Hopefully, you'd be able to check out and play with the code as well. And uh, yeah, we look forward to your feedback both on the code as well as the other technical uh, aspects of the project, the video analytics uh, framework as such. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye.